Good evening, Balfour Baptist Church. Good to have you with us tonight on this beautiful Wednesday night. Glad you're tuning in at the 630 service while you're watching this. Tonight, we'll already be starting our WANA and youth program for the year. We're excited about that. But we are glad you're here with us in the sanctuary and those who are watching tonight in the taping. We want to start our night off as we uh, go through the Acts prayer method. Remembering um, the adoration, praises to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We, are, we should always give him praise for what he's done for us. We need to confess our sins to uh, make sure we're right standing with him. We ought to be thankful for what he has done for us and how he has opened the windows of blessing from heaven and showered us with good things. In supplication, we ought to be in supplication by letting our requests be known to him above. So here's what I want you to do tonight. As I begin to pray here in just a few minutes, I'm going to ask that you would call someone's name to the Lord tonight that you know that needs to be saved. And I just believe that God will take that and begin to start planting seeds in people's hearts tonight. Because the truth is, if we're not about seeing people saved to the kingdom of God, then why are we here? So we ought to be concerned about folks' eternity. It's, um, it seems to be more evident each and every day as we go. Because if we look at the things of our world that's taking place, and even with sicknesses, with cancers, those are in automobile wrecks and stuff like that. So if you would pray for someone tonight who that you know that needs the Lord, and uh, just trust that God will speak through that prayer to that person, and God will continue to uh, plant that seed and for it to be uh, watered. Uh, tonight, we need to remember Sister Lynn Myers. Uh, they were here Sunday. It was good to see her and Brother Joe here. Remember them in your prayers. Uh, remember Don Witt, our evangelist, who's flying in, who will be here this Sunday for our revival. So please make sure you tune in or come to our revival starting Sunday morning at 9 and 11 a.m. Then Sunday night at 6.30, we will have our uh Sunday school at 5.30, then we'll stop a little early there, and then we will start revival at 6.30. And then uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday night of next week will be at 7 o'clock. Uh, remember to pray for Debbie Shope. Uh, Pastor and I were over there yesterday. We had prayer with her. She's still in a lot of pain. A lot of things are going uh, on there, so help her. Uh, help it will help her to know that you're lifting her up in prayer. Remember Miss Pat Glass. Remember Brenda Saylor, who's still recovering from that broken leg. She's doing so much more better. Judy Cassell, uh, she has bronchitis. You know, she has lung issues anyway. So let's remember her. Brother Tony Concatelli, he was in the house this past Sunday. Continue to pray for his foot to heal and things there with his heart. It was good to see Sister Sarah Southern this past Sunday. Brother Cleve Be Beasley was here also. Uh, continue to pray uh, for my son, Mark II, uh, as he's battling COVID. And uh, so he's doing some better and we covet your prayers there and want to thank you for that. Wayne Applewhite, uh, Bill Applewhite's brother, came home Saturday and is doing so much more better. I know last week at our deacons meeting, Brother Bill brought his name forth as we prayed in our deacons meeting and things wasn't looking so good then. Friend of Jennifer and Kenny Miller's, Jessica Russell Hunt, please remember this. I think she has COVID. Emma Glass, a, a, a 13 year old that's in the hospital. Remember Ben Kinder, he uh, should be hopefully getting out of the hospital today or the next day or two uh, from this COVID. Hannah Beasley, this is the Beasley's granddaughter, so remember her. Sister Reed Moody has come home. She's at home recuperating there, getting her strength back. Uh, remember Pam Gray recovering from her surgery. And also remember Sister Jewel Applewhite, who has some health issues there. So we have a lot of needs this 
morning. There are also needs out uh, that we haven't been told, but the wonderful thing is our Savior knows about those needs. And all we have to do is go before Him in prayer and trust and know that God will meet our needs even before we make our supplications before Him. And that's what I love about serving the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope that um, where you're at tonight, that you're doing well. And if you, in it, let me just say, if you haven't got everything put under the blood, then tonight would be the night to do that. As pastor's been preaching on finishing well and, and things like that, uh, I often stop and think, Lord, am I doing exactly how I should be doing? And I think if we would check ourselves, we might begin to find there are some things in our lives that we need to straighten up. Maybe you're negative all the time about everything that's going on. Is that what God calls us to be? Is to be negative about everything and everybody? No, I think we uh, ought to have some adoration as our Acts prayer method tells us. And I'm not perfect. I have to confess my sins. But at least I know the one who can forgive him and the one who puts him under the blood. So it's that kind of stuff. If we would concentrate on what's wrong with us instead of everybody else, then maybe the light on everybody else would be just a little bit brighter than it trying to be on us. So right where you're at, if you'll go with me in prayer tonight, Father, we thank you for all that you do. And Lord, I'm just reminded as tonight in youth, we'll be looking in the book of James and God, there's so much stuff in there that applies to my life and to everyone's life. So God, as we come before you, we want to say thank you, Lord, for who you are. God, you created everything. There's nothing that you don't know about. You were here in the beginning and you will never end according to your word. So God, I, I bring adoration before you to thank you, Lord, to know that you love me enough to send your son Jesus to the cross of Calvary. God, that you love me enough that when I confess my sins before you, Lord, they're washed under the blood they are forgotten as far as the east is from the west, as your word tells us. So God, we thank you for that. And Lord, you know when I fall short. But Lord, I also know that you want to hear us confess that. So Lord, as we meditate tonight on your word, may we take an inward inventory of where we're at. Lord, your word tells us that when there's a speck in my brother's eye, how can I point fingers at him when I'm toting a plank in my own eye? So God, let us remember that. That it's only by your grace that we're able to do any of the things that you call us to do. And Lord, so we want to thank you. And magnify your name tonight. With thanksgiving in our heart. And Father, if... We're full of strife and envy and hatred and all that kind of stuff. Then we truly can't worship with you tonight. So Lord, we're so thankful that God, that you know us, you needed us together in our mother's womb. And we thank you for that. But Lord, help us learn to do better as we come into the courts of the Lord with thanksgiving in our heart. Oh God, we just thank you for the touch that you're helping those who are sick. Those who walking or have walked through the valley of the shadow of death, Lord, that your hand of protection and guidance is there. Oh God, we thank you tonight that from the smallest prayer to the greatest of prayers, God, that you know them all and how you know my tomorrow before my today has even ended. God, we thank you for your grace and mercy. And so, Lord, we bring these requests before you. Those who are in the hospital, 
those who are battling COVID. Lord, I pray for our schools and our teachers and oh God, the administrators is they're short staffed and it seems to be that schools are closing down to go back to remote learning. God, we pray that your hand would be upon Balfour Baptist Church and its families that Lord, that you keep this COVID at bay. God, we pray for our country. We pray for those who are in charge of it, making decisions. Lord, I just pray for revival in America. That God, that we would come to repentance. And Lord, and realize how wonderful you are. And how great you are. God, how you have blessed the United States of America. Father, I pray for our revival that is starting this Weekend with Brother Don Witten. God, I pray for safe traveling mercies. Lord, I pray that your hand will be upon him and his wife as they come to bring the word of God to us. And God, that hearts would be tentative to what the Holy Spirit is saying. And God, that an outpouring of revival will break loose here at Balfour Baptist Church. And Lord, to those who want to come, let them come, Lord. Lord, I'm so grateful that we have this spacious sanctuary with controlled air that cleans the air as we breathe in and out, as it will be sanitized. So God, we thank you for that. Oh Lord, I think about some of our kids that are here tonight in Awanas and in our youth program. God, I pray that Lord, they little hearts and minds would be open to your word tonight. God, I'm so grateful for those who volunteer to help do this, that it doesn't become a burden on them, but Lord, that it's a joy to be able to teach little ones and older ones about the name of Jesus. So God, move in our lives. Lord, and we pray for all these things, but Lord, first and foremost, Lord, we ask that, God, that you would move in our lives. The Father, that things are right here before they can be right anywhere else. Oh, God, let us take the scales of this world away from our eyes and see the goodness and the glorious love that you have for us. God, is, your grace is imparted to us day in and day out. Father, how your son Jesus was raised from the dead to give us life and give it more abundantly. God, I thank you for those who call Balfour Baptist Church home. Lord, and I know that there are still visitors coming and checking us out. So God, if it be thy will, Lord, let them call Balfour Baptist Church home. Lord, I pray for our sister churches here in our community, here in our city, here in our state, here in our world. God, that the power of the Holy Spirit would be evident in the houses of God. Lord, may we see people come in and sense the very presence of your Holy Ghost. And God, that they leave changed for your kingdom. God, that your word would permeate their heart. Your Holy Spirit would begin to work on their heart and their minds and realize that the greatest mistake we could ever make is dying without Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. So God, take this time as our shepherd Gary Mason will come and bring this message tonight. God, that you anoint him with the unction of the Holy Spirit tonight. And God, to those who are watching and who are here in the sanctuary, that they receive a blessing because it's your word, Father. Father, hide us behind your cross. May people see you first and foremost of all. So God, have your way here at Balfour Baptist Church. And to those who visit, to those youngsters and those youth who are here tonight, and Lord, to their parents, God, we thank you for them. To our staff who gives so tirelessly their time to reach children and youth for the kingdom of God. 
So, Lord, we can't do any of it without you or without your power. So if you'd move in this place tonight, Lord, we'll give you the glory for it. We thank you, Father, for all that you do and all that's about to take place. And to God be the glory is our cry tonight. Lord, may you be glorified, for it's in the wonderful and almighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and all God's people said, amen. Remember, folks, Jesus loves you. He really does. God bless you, Pastor. Well, good evening, and uh, it's good to have all of you here tonight, and um, the Lord has led me to a passage of Scripture that I did a study on several years ago, and um, I know that I have shared this down at Crossroad and uh, at the Retirement Center, and um, and I want to share it with you tonight and, and just pray that God would use it to speak to all of our hearts. Um, if you remember last week, we talked about uh, the finality of death and how death comes. And uh, we talked about living well to die well. And I don't know why uh, the Lord's kind of bringing all this uh, together today. And I was actually going to preach something that will be related to this for tonight. But we're going to allow... Uh, our revival services to be broadcast live over the Facebook, and so uh, uh, we will not uh, be meeting to do that. But what I'm going to talk to you tonight is about what are the benefits of death to the believer. And we all need to be reminded of this. Uh, this will not be any scripture that many of you have not heard many times, but it is something for all of us to understand and to realize and, and to have to hold on to. Yesterday, Mark and I went to a lady, and we sat there, and we talked with her. We've already mentioned her name, and uh, she is probably, unless God intervenes, is not long for this world. And uh, we sat there, and that's where ministry really, you know, sometimes you deal with complaints and gripes and all kind of things. You know how human beings are. People are, are that way. But the real intent of ministry is when you're on the cutting edge dealing with somebody that's fixing to step off into eternity. And... Um, and to be able to sit there and to be with a woman who knows that she knows that she's been born again, knows that she has Christ living in her heart, and to come with the reality of knowing that there's coming a time very soon when God's going to call her out of this world and call her into a place that uh, is beyond our description. So that's what I want to talk about tonight. So what are the benefits to all of us? And I want to open up with uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. And um, I actually, I've got this noted in my Bible. Um, I preach these same words at Maynard Reed's funeral. And uh, that's just in my Bible here. But it's how far back, uh, you know, we think about uh, how valuable this is for us to have. It says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Verse 53, for this incorruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But give thanks to God, which giveth to us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So that's my challenge to all of you tonight. For those that are here in the sanctuary, to each one that listens tonight, uh, there by way of our broadcast. I pray that all of you would be encouraged to just remain faithful, to hang on to what you have, and to know that nothing can separate you from the love of God. I like that saying, as y'all have heard me say many times, that Mark says that, Jesus loves you, he really does, because the Bible tells us he does. And the Bible says that his love is everlasting love, and that there's nothing that can separate us from that. So 
So the greatest benefit that comes with death is that we will be free from all the pains and the sorrows and the evils of this life. And we will be safely in God's presence forever. When you see a woman that's standing there, eat up with cancer, and she's miserable, she's not feeling well, she's sick, and you know it, and yet she still has the grace of God to be able to crack a smile and to look at you and to recognize that she realizes that this battle is not far from being over unless God intervenes. And to see the faithful person who still believes, my God can do anything. And God can took that, take this away from me. So therefore, I continue this course. And I continue to fight. But she said, but there'll probably be a time when I'll say, okay, uh, I'll take the pain management and then I'll go home. So folks, that's where all of us probably at some point in our life will be. So we, we, we must understand what waits for all of us. If you think about it, when Jesus was crucified at Calvary, it is a lot like when we purchased our life insurance policy. Now, I want you to think about this. The benefits of the package determines the cost of the policy. And the issued or the insured must die in order for that insurance policy to pay off. So think for just a minute with me about insurance and about the benefits of that insurance policy and that the only way that it'll pay off is that life has to be paid. Now, no matter how wealthy a person is, only one could pay the cost of eternal life for each one of us. And the benefits are guaranteed and held in the treasury of hope. You know, some of us have different insurance companies that we deal with, and we've got our life insurance, and we know that on our death that certain things will be allotted to our family members, pay our bills, pay our final expenses, whatever. But what I want us to think about tonight is that insurance policy that we have through Christ. That when we die and leave this world, that it will be held in the treasury of hope, a blessed hope that we all have. Now the policy owner is Jesus Christ. The cost was his life's blood on that cross to redeem us from sin. Now the fully paid benefit is our assurance of eternal life in God's kingdom. There's not a woman or a man in here today that is worthy in yourself to be able to enter into the King of Kings and Lord of Lords home in heaven. The Bible clearly tells us that none of us are righteous, no, not one, and that the heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? And as I look out in this building tonight, all of you have hearts for God. All of us have desires to draw closer to him. And yet the Bible tells us that without him, we're not worthy. But because of him, we are made worthy. Now, that full benefit of that eternal life policy that we have is to live forever with him. And it is redeemable, redeemable to those who exchange a simple heart for a clean, forgiven heart. That's how you get that policy. You know, I think about this Sunday and when Don Witt comes here and we begin our revival services at nine o'clock, at 11, at 6.30 on Sunday, seven o'clock on Monday, seven o'clock on Tuesday, seven o'clock on Wednesday. And my prayer is this, is that we would invite people to come. Yes, we would come and hear the word of God, but that we would reach out to somebody and say, won't you come and join me? at our revival service. And my desire is that somebody might receive this glorious insurance policy that covers them for all eternity. They might receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. My prayer is Sunday morning that, that this revival will start off strong, that the word of God will be preached and there'll be somebody here uh, or many somebodies that will surrender their life to the cause of Christ and give their life fully to him. When the soul passes from death to new life, the faith of things hoped for then is clearly seen. In Luke 12, 34, it says this, where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. So where's your treasure tonight? For all of us that are listening to this message, 
I want us to remember our treasure is laid away in heaven. Our treasure awaits us someday when we will enter into his presence. So God tonight outlines his benefit package for us, each and every one that's here. And I want you to just bear with me as we go down through this, as I explain this insurance policy a little bit to you. And I think you'll see where it is. First point tonight is found in John 640. John 640. And it says, and this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up in that last day. So that's our first benefit, is know that God will raise us up in that last day if we've put our trust and our faith in him. Second benefit is in John 14, 21. It says, He that hath my commandments... And keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my father, and I will love him, and I will manifest myself unto him. And so that's a benefit that we have when we have that relationship. You see, Sunday morning when people file in here, and people sit down, there'll be some people thinking, I'm all right. I believe I'll go to heaven. I believe that, or I sure, I sure do hope that God will allow me to come home. I sure do hope that everything will be okay. I heard a lady tell me the other day, well, I hope I'm okay. Folks, I'm telling you, you got to know that you know. You can't take gambling dice and throw them on the table over your soul. you got to know that you've put your faith and trust in Him. Because the Bible says... That if we call upon the name of the Lord, if we call upon his name, and we ask him to receive us, the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon him shall be saved. And so that's what we've got to understand today. The third point is found in Revelation 2.7. Revelation 2.7. The Bible says, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. To him that overcometh. I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So folks, that means that if we have chose Jesus, that God says that he will allow us to eat of that tree of life, that we'll live eternally with him, which is in the midst of the presence of God. This world is not all there are, or all there is. The fourth point tonight is Revelation 2.10. Revelation 2.10. It says, fear none of these things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison. That you may be tried and that you will, shall have tribulation ten days. But be thou faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. None of us in this building tonight or nobody that's listening to me tonight over the airways has the promise of tomorrow. We don't know what will happen to us. We don't know what adversity we may face. We don't know that if we'll not be arrested and taken in. Folks, I don't know that I won't be up here preaching the gospel, preaching the word of God, and it not be a social gospel, and that people would come through that back door right there to escort me out of here. Folks, may you pray that God would give me the strength and the power to preach the truth of God's word as long as I have breath. That I'd stand on the principles of God's word and not be ashamed and not back up. Folks, I realize that when I come to this pulpit, that when you teach one week about abominations, there's a lot of people that don't want to hear about that because it hits too close to where we live. A lot of people don't want to hear about uh, homosexuality or don't want to hear about hate or anger or bitterness or malice or all those things. But the word of God says we must know it. And we must understand what are abominations to God. A lot of people will not like, well, I don't really need to hear about making vows. And if I mess up on my vows, it's actually, I'm an abomination to God by doing that. Folks, the word of God tells us we've got to be careful about what we promise God. And that sometimes with every vow that we make, that we have a judgment that will fall on our head. If we'll be faithful and loyal. 
Folks, I'm telling you, I am here today to preach the truth. And wherever that might fall, wherever that might go, and I don't even have any ideas sometimes, but it thrills my heart sometimes to hear people tell me that that word spoke to my heart or it spoke to my daughter's life or my son's life or it challenged me because I'd never looked at it like that. Folks, we must have the word of God. Yes, we need to hear about the love of God. I need to hear about it. I need to be reminded about what God has for me if I've trusted him. But we also must warn people that you must know him. And for you to partake of that tree of life, you must know him. You must ask Christ into your life. And and it can't be, well, I hope everything's okay. Because what I've learned in life, if we bank on what we think is right, then we got problems. We got to know. We got to by faith claim it and come against the enemy if we want that crown of life. The fifth point tonight is found in Revelation chapter 3, verse 12. It says, him that overcometh. What do we overcome? We overcome a world of filth, a world of degradation, a world of sin, a world of malice and hatred, a world that nobody likes one another. I had somebody, and I'm not going to mention names, but I had somebody tell me the other day, you know that there's such and such in the church. They don't like you. And you know, from, from a human standpoint, that kind of bothers you and hurts you a little bit. But yet at the same time, folks, my ministry is unto the Lord and that he will hold me accountable for what I preach and how I do. And my challenge is, is even when that happens, did everybody love Jesus? Did everybody love the Apostle Paul? Did everybody love Peter? The answer is no to all those. And even the greats of the Bible, we know that Jezebel threatened to have uh, Elijah murdered. Because he hated him. Couldn't stand him. Because he preached the truth. And he laid out there what was going to happen. Folks, as long as I stand in this pulpit. And if I go out of this pulpit and Mark Wilburn comes up here. No matter who it is up here. If Jonah comes up here to preach. And at some point he will. But as we preach the word of God. God will hold us accountable to speak the truth in love. And wherever the Holy Spirit sends that word, then so be it. There may be some that won't like it. There will be some that, for whatever reason, and y'all know how this works, some people just don't like some people. Now, if you look at this, this cute little face right here, how could you not love me? Because I love you. But folks, it's life. Did everybody love me when I was a policeman? A whole lot of them did, but... Some did. And so it's just life. And so we move forward in that. It says, him that overcometh, I will make him a pillar in in the temple of my God. And he shall go no more out. And I look forward to that. And I will write upon him the name of my God. And the name of the city of my God, which is the new Jerusalem, which cometh down from heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. Folks, that is the truth for every one of us. And it's hard for us to grasp all that that's saying there, but it's saying that if we'll just trust him, that God has a plan for us and we'll be with him and we'll belong to him and we will never be out of his presence again. Now, the sixth point that I want to bring up tonight is found in Revelation 21, 6. Revelation 21, 6. The word of God says, and he said unto me, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. And I will give unto him, that is the thirst, or to them, that is the thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. So this I know. Sunday morning, when our crowds come in, last week we had I think about 82 at the nine o'clock service, which is down a little bit. But we had had, uh, 122 at the 11 o'clock service. And the numbers don't really mean anything right here as I talk to you this. But if we add that up, that's about 204 people that was at church this past Sunday. 
We had been running about 250, 255. We're going through a hard time. We're going through a time right now where people's confidence is shook again as this virus is a reality. And God has blessed this place, has protected us, but we go forward in the name of Jesus. But we gather, but if we only have 200 that show up Sunday morning, this I know, the power of God will walk down these aisles, the spirit of the living God will speak to each and every heart, whether born again or not, but those who do not know him, the spirit of God will say, once again, I ask you, come to me. I ask you to lay down your life and give yourself unto me. That if you're a thirst today for something, that I'll give you just like that Samaritan woman at the well, that I'll give you drink that you'll never thirst again. And that if you only knew, it's not about whether it's Don Witt or Gary Mason or Mark Wilburn or whoever it might be in here. If David Jeremiah was in this pulpit, it's not about them. It's about the power of God that goes forth. Because a man or a woman cannot be saved unless the spirit of the living God draws them. So where does that leave us as Christians today? As we think about this benefits package. As we think about the things that await us. If one of us in this room today were to receive a report tomorrow. That you've got cancer and it ain't good. Or all of a sudden your heart decides this day. That God touches it and says, today, you're coming home. I think about my own father and think about one of the most horrible days in one way that we ever experienced as a family is the morning that I heard my mother screaming for us to come out there. And I live very close to where my mom's house is. I rushed out there that day, put on my police pants, had my white t-shirt on and my police shoes. And I ran across that lawn and over through a little patch of woods at, to my mom's house. And there lay my daddy. And he was gone. And our hearts were broken. We had a tight family and we loved one another. We loved our daddy. My mom loved her husband. But he was gone. That morning he got up trying to make his way to the bathroom like all of us do. And God said, today, you're to come home. The doctor said that no longer than when he hit the floor, he said, his life was over. He was gone. It was like his heart had exploded. Now you might say, well, why do, I, why do you say all that? That's awful personal stuff about your own family. I say that because that day's coming for every one of us. That day's coming for those who sit on a back row or sit off to the side where the preacher really can't deal with them or whatever, or they think they're hiding. But the eye of God is on them saying, you've got another day. Another opportunity to accept Christ. One of these days, for every one of us, God's going to say, today is time to come home. We went and talked to Debbie Shope the other day. And I know that Debbie knows this, that God has a plan for her life. We all know, and I believe this as sure as I stand here, that God could take that cancer away from her and totally heal her. But we also know unless something happens, she's going home. And it's imperative on her that she reminds herself every day, I've committed all that I have to the Lord, that I am ready. She testified of that yesterday. Her mother sat there with Mark and I, and no doubt her heart wrung out. And she's committed to the Lord. And how much a blessing that is, is to be there in the midst of a horrible thing. And yet two people say, you don't worry about me. I'll be in heaven. I'm going home. And I'm going to leave this sick body behind. And I'm going to leave all this stuff behind. And she testified yesterday. She said, I, she said if it were up to me, I would stay with my children. And I'd be with my grandbabies. And I don't want to leave them. But she said, I'm ready to go home. Folks, I wonder today, are you ready to go home? Have you thought about that? Most of us in here, I guess probably, well, obviously now Jonah would be the youngest one in here, but most of us are, are getting on up in age where it's becoming more of a reality. But let me tell you something. He don't know that he'll live tomorrow. He don't know that God will say, Jonah, today you come home. 
So that's, that's the key. Most people think, well, I've got plenty of time. Thank God he's born again, saved, ready to go. But there's a lot of people that's his age and younger, they don't know him. They have no idea if they'd be ready if the hand of God was to touch their life, if God smote them. You don't know, just like I did the other day going up that road when an accident will happen and your life could be taken from you. Y'all realize how easy it would have been that Mark would be filling in today preaching in this pulpit because your pastor had gone on to glory. That's how close it came. And yet God said, not today. Not now. There's still work to be done. I believe the devil would love to have took me out of here. I believe the devil would love to have robbed my wife of her husband. And I believe the devil would love for me to have been robbed of my children. I believe the devil would rob me from my mother. And I believe the devil would have took me from all of you. And God said, not today. Not today. And folks, it's not about me. But I say that to illustrate that we must keep our life in God's hands. And we must trust him. I look forward to drinking from the fountain of water, of life, eternal life freely. And it leads us to the seventh point, And that is Revelation 21, 7. It says, he who overcomes will inherit all this. And I will be his God. and He will be my son. So I want you to understand tonight that if you've, you've accepted Christ, that you've made the greatest decision that you'll ever make in your life. I feel confident in this room today that as I look across this room, I think that everybody here knows Jesus in a personal way. But I just bet there may be somebody tonight that's listening that can look at me right now through that camera's eye and, and say, you know what? I hope I'm ready, but I don't know. But folks, I'm here to tell you tonight, you can know. If you'll just hit your knees and call out to the Lord. Some people will say, well, pastor, you don't understand. I don't know how to, I don't know how to pray like Mark Wilburn does. I don't know how to pray like a preacher does or, or one of these ladies that has the ability to call upon the name of the Lord. I don't know how to do that. Well, folks, all you got to do is just talk to him. He's the best friend that you'll ever have. He's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. And he stands waiting right now with his arms outstretched saying, if you'll just come to me, then ask me what you want. And what you've got to ask him is say, Father, forgive me of my sins. Save me. Come into my heart. And God, guide me and lead me into life everlasting. Lord, write my name in the Lamb's book of life. God, when death invades my life, help me to face it knowing with full assurance I've been born again and I've been saved. So, unlike the insurance policies we purchase, the greatest benefit received at a believer's death is not found written in the small print. But folks, the greatest benefit for us is in the nail prints of Jesus' hands. That's what grants all of us the victory today. If you sit in this church and remember that cross that we erected back during the month or so of uh, maybe a couple of months there at Easter, and I promise you it'll be back again. But when we looked upon that cross, the whole intent and purpose is for you to understand that every filthy, wicked thing that I've ever done or ever attached itself was nailed to that tree. And that everything that could ever be spoke against you was nailed to Jesus when he hung on that tree. And that the blood of Christ washed away all of our sins. So what's the way to get the greatest benefit out of this life? Is to choose life. And to accept that greatest insurance policy. The greatest decision you'll ever make is not whether you go to state or Carolina. The greatest decision that I ever made was not that I chose Joanna McNeil to be my wife. And it was a great decision. But that's not the greatest. 
The greatest decision I ever made was not to become a law enforcement officer and get a 30-year career in. It's very important, and I'm thankful for my retirement and all that. The greatest thing that we ever had is not the gift of having Social Security someday where that money can come. But folks, I'm here to tell you the greatest decision that anybody will ever make is that I choose this day to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I think about that day we were talking about today and my mind has traveled back many miles this day. But I remember sitting in Pleasant Cross Christian Church and a man preaching a youth revival, a Wesleyan minister. His name was Lane Lohman. And Lane preached a message that day in that church house. And this young teenage boy was there. And for the first time really in my life, the spirit of the living God got a hold of my life. And I recognized I needed to confess my sins before God and ask him to save me. I wish so much today that I could find that Lane Loman to tell him what change took place in my life that day. As I went to that altar at a revival, I heard somebody say today, you know, said a lot of people think that revivals just don't work anymore. They're old school. Folks, I remember when there was revivals at every church around and God moved in them and this country was in a better place because of them. Therefore, we will have a revival this coming weekend. And it will go into next week. I remember when it used to be from Sunday to Sunday. I remember when there were brush arbors and, and, and that where people would worship God and seek his face. And folks, if we don't get back to that, we're going down the tubes. We must know him today. And we must make that confession of knowing him as our greatest, as our greatest decision. In Psalm 16... 8 through 11. It's called the Messianic Psalm. And I, I want to go over there. And if you have your Bibles, certainly go over there. But in Psalm 16. And Peter and Paul both quoted from this. So I want to share with you this Psalm. It says, preserve me, O God, beginning with verse 1. For in thee do I put my trust. O oh, my soul, thou hast said unto the Lord, Thou art my Lord, my goodness extendeth not to thee. But to the saints that are in the earth, and to the excellent in whom is all my delight. Their sorrows shall be multiplied that hasten after another God. Their drink offerings of blood will I not offer, nor take up their names unto my lips. The Lord is the portion of mine inheritance and of my cup. Thou maintainest my lot. The lines are fallen unto me in pleasant places. Yea, I have a goodly heritage. I will bless the Lord who hath given me counsel. My reins also instruct me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand and I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad, and my glory rejoiceth, and my flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou will not leave my soul in hell, thank God, and neither will thou suffer thy Holy One to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life, and in thy presence is the fullness of joy, and at thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. May God bless the reading of his word. And may God help all of us to realize that we all desperately need him. And that we need him to show us the path that we're to take. Because he has promised, I will not leave your soul in hell. Folks, I want you to understand that. He has given us something that is far more valuable than diamonds and rubies. of Gold and silver. But he's given us eternal life to be with him forever. May we trust him, may we lean upon him, and may we put our whole life invested in his love. Would you pray with me? Father, I pray in the name of Jesus.
that God, you would help this message tonight to resonate in the hearts and lives of every man, every woman, every boy and every girl that may stumble upon this message, that may listen to it. God, may you help us to realize, God, that great is the reward and the blessings to those who receive Jesus. Lord, I think about that lady at the, at the well. And when Jesus said, lady, if you recognized who I was, that you would ask to drink of me. Father, today I pray that you'll help many people to thirst for you. And that, God, they would drink of you and receive you as their Lord and Savior. God, I pray that you'll bring people Sunday. I pray they'll come Sunday morning. I pray they'll come Sunday evening. I pray Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday that, God, you would bring those who have a divine appointment to hear the word of God. And, God, I pray that you'd save them from a devil's hell. God, change lives, I pray. Stir up the Holy Spirit inside of people. God, help us to wake up and to understand that, God, we need you more now than ever before. So, God, I love you tonight. I honor you and I praise you. And I thank you, O oh God, for the strength and health that I've had to stand here tonight for the voice to be able to shout out the praises of God and, Lord, to hopefully point someone to Jesus. God, help us to ponder our eternity. Help us to think about our end of life when it comes. And Lord, help us to be ready. God, may you grant us eternal life. May you grant us our name being written in the Lamb's book of life. May you grant us the privilege of knowing that though my sins be as scarlet, they shall be made white as snow. And though they be as crimson, they shall be made as wool. God, pass on over our sins. Forgive us of our failures and shortcomings. And God, help us to keep our eyes upon you. Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.